On your Tuesday episode of Locked On Raptors, the Toronto Raptors fall to the Boston Celtics 116-110, and everyone's very mad. We'll talk about Fred Van Vliet having another rough shooting night. We'll dig into the experiment as a whole, because you know what? A loss to the Celtics is a good time for existential dread and compl- contemplation. We'll get to all that today with our pal Vivek Jacob of Raptors.com. It'll be pretty happy, all things considered, I think. Maybe. We'll see. It's all coming up. You are Locked On Raptors, your daily Toronto Raptors podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on? Welcome to episode number 1295 of Locked On Raptors for Tuesday. Yeah, Tuesday, December the 6th. I'm your host, Sean Woodley. You can follow me on Twitter at Woodley Sean. I've been covering the Toronto Raptors for nine seasons. You can check out all of my work over there. Uh, and of course, you can find the show on Twitter as well at Locked On Raptors. You can follow, subscribe to, rate, and review the podcast for free on your favorite audio apps. And we are, of course, on YouTube. Please go and subscribe to the video version of the show each day. Just search Locked On Raptors into YouTube. It'll pop right up because, baby, I got that algorithm humming. Please support the show. It's much appreciated when you go ahead and do that. Speaking of supporting the show, this episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. As the world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available 100% online. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnNBA. All right. On today's show... Your Toronto Raptors fall to the Boston Celtics, 116-110. The Celtics are very, very good, you see, and the Raptors were not quite up to it, despite a very spirited first-half performance. Uh, And we're going to dig into the loss and pick up the pieces. A loss that has a lot of people feeling some kind of way as the Raptors fall to 12-12. and They continue to kind of spin their wheels here. You get Pascal Siakam back, you figure, hey, maybe there's a run coming. But as it turns out, there's some other stuff to figure out. Uh, What we don't have to figure out is who our guest is today. That's, of course, Vivek Jacob from Raptors.com. Of course, doing wonderful World Cup coverage over at CTV right now as well. Big V, how the hell are you, man? I'm good. I'm good. Juggling uh, both the Raptors and the World Cup has been a very fun experience, but (laughs) also... I look forward to December 18th when I can get back to a normal sleep schedule. Yeah, that sounds about right. I guess the the moving on from the group stage, no more 5 a.m. games. Is, yeah, uh, is that's been nice. big. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's uh, lovely to have you back on the show here, dude, to, uh, I guess, talk about this game that no one's really happy about. So let's... Uh, Let's dive in, shall we? Biggest takeaway, I feel like you go a whole bunch of different directions here. I know where I'm kind of leaning, but I will put it to you, sir. What's your biggest takeaway? What are you thinking about most coming out of that loss to the Boston Celtics last night? Yeah, so I tweeted about this in terms of the Raptors kind of needing to create some type of breathing room. It's like when, when you look at them on court, it's obviously create deflections, create turnovers, get out and run um, and, you know, create as much transition offense as possible uh, and alleviate some of those half court concerns. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think the Raptors do need some type of breathing room. Uh, And when I say that, I also think about, think about when Fred Van Vliet is struggling, right. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's, normal for one of your core four uh to have a bad stretch in the season but for the raptors i feel like it's either those four have to be playing great all the time Mm. or they're not or they're going to be really up against it to win Mm -hmm. and i think that is where that margin for error is really really thin like even as he's struggling everyone's like he's got to shoot his way out of it right like it's not (laughs) like you can just lean on another guy and fred can be like okay you know what i'm just gonna take three or four shots tonight (laughs) it's not my (laughs) night you know what i mean i mean fred's Mm -hmm. not that type of guy anyway but no you get what i mean like there isn't that extra person like Mm -hmm. gary is there uh off the bench now which is nice and it's nice to get that pop um but you know i think some sort of stabilizer in that regard is important and it either has to come in the form of scoring or it has to you know come in the form of a big who can stabilize the rotations Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i think having 
that because I think that's another thing, right? Like as you sort of play out the rotations over the course of the 48 minutes, there are those units where the Raptors look very exposed and the opponent takes full advantage of that. And so those are the things that I'm looking at this season um, that give me a bit of pause about, you know, what my expectations are. That's fair. You know, I have a hard time. I think it's fair to be having a hard time kind of figuring this team out 24 games in, right? Because they've had a lot of guys in and out. There's been a lot of, you know, they've changed the starting lineup a thousand times. Um, And it is difficult to kind of get any sort of read on things that are sort of reliable, things you can count on. Even, you know, guys like Thad Young, for who was sec there, was looking incredible, is now kind of in this lesser role off the bench. And you're getting a little bit less reliability out of him. It, it is difficult when you kind of know, all right, Pascal Siakam is going to be amazing. That's that's just a given. He's, my God, he's so good, Big V. He's incredible. 29, 8, and 7 last night. Just walking into that every night. It's great. Um, that's a really good starting point. If you're looking for big picture reasons to feel all right, Pascal Siakam whips ass and does every single night. And so that's a good place to be. I feel like OG, you know, is going to be a menace defensively. We'll talk about what he did to Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown in the first half of that game uh, later on in the show. Um, but, like, you know what you're going to get from OG most of the time. The three-point shooting is waxed and waned a little bit, yeah, and that's a big problem. You, you know, this is a team that came into the season without a ton of shooting, and you have OG and Fred and Gary Trent Jr. all shooting under 35%. Like, that's going to give you some issues. And, and, you know, I think we came into the season maybe a little optimistic about the shooting potential here thinking all right maybe pascal bounces back which he has i think he's like their best three-point shooter right now it's crazy um very good turns out uh he's their best pat- everything he, he really is uh we thought precious achua was going to maybe have a bit of a, a three-point shooting continuation of what we saw at the end of the year he got hurt and also wasn't shooting well before then and so yeah there's a little bit less margin for error here to have your main guys not knocking him down auto porter jr has has barely played boy auto porter jr seems really important huh it's uh it's troublesome that the and that, played, like, that again goes to my is, point right yeah. like the breathing room like he feels almost too important yeah i think yeah that's uh that's well put it, it's i just i don't know where the line of like early season mismatch roster sort of non-continuity stuff blends into actual real life problems and i feel like it's got to be somewhere in the middle honestly like this team typically once it kind of has its guys together for a few games will typically get get their sort of thing into into form and, and go on a bit of a run that's typically how it's gone under nick nurse like he gets the same group of guys for a handful of games he'll figure out how to win games with those guys and and pull the right levers but you know, they haven't had enough games where it's been consistent. And I do think there are some kind of glaring issues in terms of, you know, the unreliability of Christian Coloco. Do you know what you're getting from him every single night, every single half, right? It can kind of oscillate back and forth. And the three-point shooting, it, it, it's... I, I don't know what the real issues are, man. It's uh, like, let's let's talk about Fred. Because Fred Van Vliet having himself a down season, of course. He's under 35% from three. He goes one of six last night. I believe he's five of 28 over his last four games from downtown. Um, You know, he's missed time with injury and illness and more injury and more illness. It's been a very weird, rocky start for him. And again, I don't know what is real and what is tied to the weird, rocky, inconsistent start and his availability, but the fact that he's not hitting his threes right now, the fact that he seems to be kind of shooting himself or trying to shoot himself out of this slump as it's all going on. And it's kind of complicating matters. I mean, like I think the Raptors lost this game against the Celtics in that third quarter where a Jason Tatum was going off and B Fred was kind of shooting them out of it as he was trying to find his form. Like that feels to me like maybe the place to start here problems wise. And I don't know how to reckon with it, man. Is it real? Is Fred Van Vliet just busted now? I don't think he is like how many times does a dude have to like claw himself back out from the doghouse of the fan base and be amazing and prove everybody wrong Like he does it all the time. And I would imagine it's going to happen again here, but is there a certain point at which you get concerned about the Fred Van Vliet shooting numbers? Like, do you wonder if it's just him now? At what point does that happen? And at what point does that bleed into the way you view Fred's long-term future with the team, frankly? Yeah. So, Overall, I am not concerned about Fred Van Vliet uh, mm-hmm. as a player. Like, I think he will get his three-point shooting going. He is actually uh, 
you know, doing all right with the non corner threes. He's at 35%. He was 37% last year and 39% before that. So um, I think that is closer to where you would expect. It's the corner threes um, that have fallen off a click cliff. That's at 32%. He was at 46% last season. Um, and so, you know, he's not taking as many corner threes as well. We've seen kind of Gary get more of those looks this season. So that's another thing to factor in. The thing that also concerns me is like Fred has never been good at the rim. Mm. And we've talked about that, but he's also been over 50% mm. <laughs> and, <laughs> and now he's at down to 44%. Right. Uh, and so that's taken him from being a guy that was in like the 25th and like 30th percentile to now the eighth percentile. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and yeah, when you go from being like a mediocre finisher at the rim to just like one of the worst. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is a big concern. I'm not going to criticize him for trying to shoot his way out of it. Mm -hmm. I think that is where, you know, we see some people online kind of get on the whole, like he's a ball hog, this and that. The Raptors just flat out need him, right? Again, yeah. you know, sticking with my point uh, about the breathing room, like the Raptors need him to take 10, 12 threes a game. Um, and you just hope he makes them. Mm -hmm. Uh like that three point difference that we talk about in all these other games where it's like, man, you can't make up for, you know, another team making like 10 more threes than you. Right. Part of that is addressed by Fred being good. And so I don't have a problem with him being aggressive. He was really aggressive. Like that first sickness he had and like the time he missed, mm -hmm. uh, you think about before that, when he was really playing a passive role, Mm -hmm. um i kind of didn't like that role for him okay um, he, he was too good to be in that role um and the way he came back initially he was dropping 30 dropping 25 dropping 30 i was like okay that's like maybe the really high end of what you need but in terms of playing style that was more of what i wanted to see so i'm not going to criticize him for so much the playing style um it's the efficiency that you need to pop back and yeah, it's it's a slump for sure. Uh, he's not playing well. He's, you know, for someone who is steady Freddie, it has not been steady at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, hopefully once he gets his shooting going, everything else just aligns. Yeah. And like, do I think we're going to see all star Fred from the first half of last year again? Probably not. They don't. That's not what that team this team needs. Right. Unless they are missing two of their three big wings, they're probably not going to need fred to kind of take up the mantle that way which you know that's totally fine because i think he's his perfect sort of role on this team is he works off of the three big creating wings and benefits from it gets lots of catch and shoots out of it you know i talked yesterday on the show about how his sort of pull-ups to catch and shoots in the last month have been totally out of whack he's been taking way more pull-ups than catch and shoots you get pascal back you kind of get these three guys kind of humming again and those catch and shoots are going to be there and at some point they're going to fall. He's Fred Van Vliet and he's only 28 years old. It's not like he's 35 and like broke it into decrepit. And like, it, it, I feel like, yes, he carries himself like a sage old wisdom holding fellow, but he's just, Have the he's Raptors made him 35 with all the minutes the last three I years? mean, yeah, maybe that's, that's fair. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that, that, mm -hmm. yep, that's probably, that's possibly a thing. But I, I just feel like he's not going to have a 50 true shooting all season long, right? It's going to bounce back to some degree here it's just how these things work it's law of averages it's just i feel like we've never watched a full season before every year like we get to the first couple months of the season and it's like oh all these things must be true and it's like no it's not how it works like things yeah. have ups and downs it's it's like welcome this is i remember my first nba season like these things take time they even out and you know you take a two-week snapshot that's never going to be representative of a guy's season gary trent jr had a stretch last year where he scored 30 plus in five straight games that's not the player he is i i, I don't know i i feel like i am concerned about the fred stuff in like the now because as he's struggling like this it's going to be really hard for them to put up enough points to win but i'm also not terribly concerned about this being a long-term thing where he's just bad now 
you know, if we get to the trade deadline and he still doesn't hit a three, then yeah, maybe we'll talk. But for now, just be patient. Give it some time. It's December the 5th. There's no need for this, like, the world is melting, uh, chicken little, uh, skies falling sort of routine. It, it gets a little tired to me. We're going to continue on. We've gone long here off the top. Come back on the other side. I kind of want to talk to you about the starting lineup and, and, you know, there was like a last minute shift in audible from Nick Nurse last night. We'll dig into that and uh, maybe some reasons for optimism. Who's to say? We've got the good, the bad, and the hmm coming up later on too. Before we do all that, however, we've got to tell you about our friends over at Sweatblock, a wonderful company. Last week, I went on an airplane ride. I hopped on the plane, went down to Salt Lake City for a little work retreat, and it was great. However, when I'm on the uh, the plane, I get real sweaty because I'm kind of confined, I'm hot, I'm uncomfortable, and I get off the plane, and I am just, like, totally drenched in sweat. Not this time, though, because I used my sweat block wipes the night before I got on the plane, and I arrived in Salt Lake City to meet all my coworkers, and I was dry as a bone. It's because sweat block works to make it so you can cover up that excessive sweating and... Cool it down. They have these wonderful wipes. You throw them on the night before you go to bed. You wake up. You're dry. You have seven days of protection. It's a wonderful company that is helping those who are embarrassed by their excessive sweating. And look, there's no reason to be embarrassed by it. It's not like the worst thing in the world. Things happen. Our bodies are our bodies. We're all super weird. But... It is really nice to be able to not have those wet pitters and uh, be able to meet your coworkers and not have to worry about sweating all over all over them. If you or someone you uh, love is experiencing experience, embarrassing sweat, that is, uh, go and try Sweatblock. Save 20% off with the promo code Locked On at Sweatblock.com. You can also find them at Amazon. Go check them out, Sweatblock.com. Today's show is also brought to you by Rocket Money, which is here to save you money on the subscriptions you no longer want to use. Of course, you know this company formerly as Truebill. Are you wasting money on subscriptions? Don't do it anymore. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of energy. It's a waste of money, of course, to be paying for stuff that you don't want to be paying for, you no longer are using. And sweat, the Truebill is, sorry, excuse me, Rocket Money is going to help you cancel those subscriptions so you don't have to on your own. They, you, know, you put them all into one little account, you click the ones you don't want to have anymore and boom you're not paying any more money they keep you honest and make it so you're not throwing away stuff money for stuff that you don't use anymore cancel unnecessary subscriptions with rocket money today go to rocketmoney.com slash locked on seriously could save you hundreds of dollars per year i know it will for me because i sign up for things all the time for free trials and then get just start getting you know milked for money for the rest of the year because i'm a fool and i procrastinate things and i forget to cancel them not anymore rocket money is here that's rocketmoney.com slash locked on all right, we continue on here with our dissection of the loss to the Boston Celtics for your Toronto Raptors. Vivek Jacob from Raptors.com here. Let's talk about the starting lineup, shall we? We see again the third straight game. Lovely. Three straight games of the same starting lineup. I just wonder if maybe it's the wrong starting lineup with Christian Coloco at center. Uh, Gary Trent Jr. coming off the bench. And I feel like... Yesterday on the show, my hmm was maybe Gary Trent Jr. is just coming off the bench for the rest of time, and that's good. Maybe that's a, a useful thing to have his scoring off the bench. You don't need to rely on it too much, and you know if he's having an off night, then you're fine. No harm, no foul. Last night, however, maybe, like, I'm very fickle with this. I, I, I don't know. He was 7 of 10. He was 3 of 3 from downtown. He was the second most important offensive player for the Raptors in this one, after Pascal Siakam, it seemed. Um... And, of course, the starting lineup before the game was originally going to be the OG small starting five with Scotty Barnes as your nominal center, Gary Trent Jr. in there. They switch it last minute to put Coloco back in. What were your thoughts on the uh, last minute switch, Big V? And are you ready to go back to the small starting five? I think there's arguments for and against both things. Um, you know, we can talk about ways in which they could upgrade the roster to change this conversation entirely, but where are you at right now with the starting five and how it's being used by Nick Nurse? Would you like to see a return to the Gary Trent Jr. included starting five? I, I, I've kind of been a fan of Gary coming off the bench uh, for a while, um, or at least I've wanted that to happen for a while, so I would want to see them continue with this. Mm. Uh, I don't think Coloco should be the starting five unless it's like a need in the matchup to start the mm -hmm. game. Mm -hmm. And that's where I feel like there's been a bit of an over overreaction from the Pelicans game mm. where you go up against JV and Zion um, and no one has the strength to deal with that. So he, he tries to get some... 
uh, size in there with Coloco starting that second half. And he's mm-hmm. just deci- Nick has just decided to ride with Coloco after that. But you look at the matchups, right? You don't necessarily need that against the Nets. Uh, yeah. And they obviously got off to a horrible start in that one. Um, Nick Claxton, too fast for Coloco to deal with, as it turns out. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, the magic game is the magic game. Um, and, you know, that's that's more of a favorable matchup, right? Like, you're going up against a young team. You're going up against, uh, like, the size of Bol Bol. Uh, mm-hmm. And so I think that is more favorable. And then now, again, you look at this matchup. It's like, why can't a Thad Young start against a Blake Griffin? Yeah. Right? Uh, Old so... kindred spirits. <laughs> reminisce about the glory days or whatever. Uh, yeah. Re- reminisce about the Great Depression, which they were both alive for. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think you would look at that start of the game and you wouldn't really have much to criticize. Mm-hmm. Uh, but again, the third quarter was a problem. Yeah. And yeah, I feel like there are legitimate opportunities for that to start. Um, and I didn't think there was a need to change it for the Nets game. I didn't think uh, there was a need to have Coloco start in this one. Uh, Mm -hmm. And it's not so much a Coloco criticism as much as it is just putting players in their best position to succeed. Yeah. I mean, it's also the reality of... uh... Christian Coloco is a rookie second round pick. I talked about this yesterday, yeah. right? Like it's a lot to ask of a dude to like bring it every single night, which you desperately need specifically for this team, which asks so much of whomever is playing center to kind of be there as the last line of defense when you're sending extra attention to Jason Tatum or Jalen Brown or whomever, like you need to have reliability back on that back line. And it's what they've been missing, frankly, since Marcus all left, right? Like they've been kind of searching for it. I think I'm with you in that I like Trent off the bench because as much as he's had some nice games here, he's also liable to have a a 4 of 20 game. And I I think not having to rely on him in your starting five is a good thing. And you can bring him in off the bench. He brings you some pop. He can kind of save you in a second quarter if he kind of goes off. If you stagger him with Pascal Siakam, you're giving yourself a really good chance because those two guys are dynamite together. I'm fine with Trent sticking on the bench, but I do think, yeah, they have to try to figure out a way to do a couple things. One, find some way to insert a little bit more shooting into the into the starting five. You can. Um, I, I feel like that's kind of missing right now with Fred shooting the way he is, OG shooting the way he is. And frankly, if Otto Porter Jr. were healthy right now, I would be advocating extremely hard for Otto Porter to be your fifth starter. I, I think he would be a really yeah. nice fit in there. The big thing, though, is Scotty Barnes, as we saw last night, perimeter defense, not so much his bag right now. He's really kind of having trouble staying in front of guys, Blake Griffin included. If Blake Griffin's blown by your ass on the perimeter, that is not a good thing. But what has Scotty Barnes been good at this year? He's been a pretty good rim protector. Like, that's been the highlight of his defense this season. He's been there. He's been getting tall. He's getting long. He's not fouling a ton when, you know, guys do close in around the rim. I feel like that's the place you want to have him. And maybe he can be that back line of defense for you. You know, he's not Marcus Gasol, of course. And there will be certain matchups where you need a Coloco or a more traditional center. And, you know, Yaka Perta will be along someday, hopefully. But uh, I, I just, I feel like that's the best way to get the most out of Barnes on defense right now, while also kind of keeping the integrity of what you got going. And, and you know, maybe Thad Young, who hit two threes last night, baby. Uh, I think that he doubled his three-point output for the season or something like that. Um, you know, if you haven't been the starting five, you can still kind of play him as your nominal four defensively. He's probably got a little bit more perimeter juice than Barnes does right now. Um, I, I just feel like any way you can get Barnes around the rim and not having to sort of scramble and per- defend on the perimeter at the moment. Like, I still have a lot of belief in Barnes as a, a defender long term, but right now it's just not there. So have him do the thing that he's good at, and that actually is a thing you need in your starting five anyway. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Um, and, you know, is this... <sighs> Like, is this a fixable thing? Is this a, you know, once Fred kind of starts shooting himself out of it, maybe things all sort themselves out here. Like the, the, you know, the starts have been a notable thing, of course, all season long. And the starting five has obviously been part and parcel to all of that. But where are you at with the way things sit? And, and, you know, is rearranging the way you use Barnes in the starting five, you know, kind of maybe the most important thing here. 
Yes, it, I think it is important. I I just don't know if that's going to happen. I think the Raptors have kind of leaned into we want you to play the way we envision you at your ceiling. Mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> um, and the more you do that, the more like harsh lessons you're going to get now, but the maybe the quicker you get there. Um, and so I think that's something that, that the Raptors are doing with Barnes. Uh, you know, this was kind of in my bad portion is mm -hmm. you are, only as switchable as the positions you can guard. Sure. And so just because you are 6'8 and long, uh, it does not mean that you're necessarily switchable. And so right. Scotty Barnes right now is not a switchable defender. Mm -hmm. uh, like you said, when uh, you, you kind of minimize the need for his lateral quicks and you kind of have him protecting the rim, that's where maybe you're getting the best of him right now. But it seems like whenever he's on the perimeter, um, there's problems that can be created. There's obviously those ceiling games where you see him have uh, a good performance matched up against Trey Young in, mm -hmm. in Atlanta, but then the floor is extremely, extremely low as well. And, mm -hmm. and we've seen a lot more of that floor than we have of the ceiling. And you mentioned that play against Blake Griffin, like that just can't happen. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, and so yeah. those are the things that he's got to really work on. He spoke post game uh, and he did say, you know, I had asked him, you know, about the third quarter struggles for the team. And he specifically called himself out and was right. like, hey, I have to do a better job fighting through screens. Um, this was a physical game. I enjoy a physical game <laughs> because it kind of brings out my strengths, but I also have to do a better job uh, of fighting through screens and um, and then even again, when he's just flat out on ball, recognizing his length, like I think he can give himself more room to work with defending on ball. OG Ananobi is a complete wreaker of havoc. He's a and freak. Can he's incredible. Apply all the yeah. ball pressure in the world. Mm -hmm. If Scotty tries to do that, he's just going to get blown by yeah. nine times or 10 times out of 10. Yeah, it's uh, it's dire right now. At the same time, you know, we're talking like this. Oh, who, how do they fix the line? Like, they're seventh in defense right now. Like, they're <laughs> they're still very yeah. good. Like, yeah, I, I mean, obviously there are issues, and obviously you want to be punching at a higher level than hey, maybe we can give the Celtics some problems. But I also like, I don't know. I feel like maybe the the accelerator on expectations has maybe hit a, been hit a little hard, and I, I don't know how fair that is. Maybe yeah. I'm just like, you know, someone who's just like, yeah, feed me slop. I don't care if they win or not. I just want to watch basketball. Maybe I'm not the right person to ask this question to, but like, I'm not alarmed right now. I'm not like concerned, and I feel like a lot of the solutions are in house. It's just, you know, get some more time playing together. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm just being too like ah, devil may care. It's fine, but also like I've done that before and it's worked out pretty well. Uh, so we're gonna continue on. Come back on the other side. Dig into the good, the bad, and the hmm from the game against the Celtics to round things out. Before we do that, however, I need to tell you about Prize Picks, which has made daily fantasy sports fun easy, exciting, accessible, which is the main thing, and uh, really, really great. So go and check them out. You can pick two to five players in your prize picks entry each and every night and pick whether they're going to score more or less than the projected number for their given stat, whether it's points, rebounds, assists, steals, blocks, all on down the line. You pick more or less and you get all of them right you can win up to 10 times your money on any entry no competing against other people it's just you against the projections which is the way to play daily fantasy you don't want to have some expert behind in their parents basement just putting together a team you can't beat no you are instead just up against the projections that have been put together by prize picks wonderful staff and you can do any sport you want really you can do cross sport entries you've got college sports women's college basketball soccer wnba esports nascar tennis disc golf european basketball basketball and all of course all the big four pro leagues as well you got the pga it's all in there 
and you can make your entries in 60 seconds or less. It's that easy. Safe and fast withdrawals as well. Currently operational in over 30 states and in Canada in all provinces except for Ontario at the moment, but that could change anytime. Download the PrizePix app or go to prizepix.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code locked on, meaning you put in 100 bucks of your own money and boom, up appears $100 of PrizePix's money into your account to match your deposit. Don't forget to enter the promo code locked on on at sign up for an instant deposit match up to $100 today. All right, we continue on here with Vivek Jacob rounding out the show with the good, the bad, and the hmm from the game against the Boston Celtics last night. I'm going to go with my good, stay on my sort of, you know, generally positive brand. Um, I keep on coming away really impressed with how Scotty Barnes, Pascal Siakam, and OG and Obi are playing, man. And ultimately, I can't get too doom and gloom because you got those three dudes on the team. You're probably going to be fine. Those guys rock. And as much as Scotty has had his ups and downs and, you know, he'll throw away an outlet pass a little overzealously here and there. I feel like the last three games, he's really rounded into form. He's got a lot more aggression in his game. He's backing dudes down to the post and turning those little float shots up and scoring a whole bunch on them. Uh, He's playing with joy and fervor and, you know, the typical sort of vibe you tend to see from Scotty Barnes. We've talked about Pascal Siakam. OG is just an absolute monster defensively and has been a nice um you know it's not always there he'll sometimes leave shots short and all that but a lot of the offensive expansion stuff for him has been i think within his realm of capability and he's been pretty good at it and ultimately those three guys playing at a high level everything else is going to sort itself out around them am i being too optimistic where do you where are you at with those three guys right now and also what is your good from this game yeah i mean pascal and og like my expectations are being exceeded, right? Like yeah. they are just absolutely balling. I have zero negative to say about them. Um, maybe you, it's like if you really want to nitpick that Celtics game, you you know, OG, a couple of those uh, catches you wish he made. Um, Pascal even like, you know, the bounce pass was probably not the right play in that situation in, in transition. Um, sure. Or he's got to at least draw the defender a bit more before he does that. Um, and then with Scotty, uh, defensively, you know, the expectations are not being met. Uh, yeah. I think he can be, he should be better uh, in that regard. Uh, offensively, it's it's definitely coming along. I think the point you made about his finishing around the basket, I think mm-hmm. we've seen some of those, uh, you know, finishes that we were accustomed to seeing last season. And I think that's really encouraging. So uh, that's how I would kind of, lay that out in terms of the good i will go with gary's aggressiveness off the bench Mm. um i know before the season started when we when there's been all this debate about who should be in the starting five Mm -hmm. there was a lot made of oh gary just is not good off the bench because he had like a small sample of games (laughs) off the bench where he was not good um and now you're seeing that he can absolutely be good off the bench Mm -hmm. uh He's really attacked the basket um, since that move has been made. And uh, I hope that continues. You know, you really wish he had that layup where, (laughs) you know, you're right there then. Um, But other than that, I I think he's playing well. I think he's taken Nick Nurse's message in the right spirit. And yeah, that, that is my good I love it. Uh, I'm going to go with my bad now. My bad is, uh, I don't know what's going on with Chris Boucher, but it's been a bit of a weird run for him. Um, just kind of not having the same pop that he usually has, the same kind of like inje- like injection of energy that he brings to games. He's been, you know, fine. He had three offensive boards last night. That's what you like to see. Uh, but mainly, I think it's the shooting from Chris Boucher that I'm like, maybe I shouldn't be disappointed because he's just doing what he did last year, shooting sub 30%. But I really did feel like there was going to be some sort of evening out here with Boucher with what he did in Tampa where he shot 39% and then 29% last year. Like, I thought, 34? Yeah, that's on the table. And for the start of the season, he was at, like, 60% for two weeks. And then it's, you don't think he's hit a three since. Um, and, and, like, that also complicates things here right like i kind of expected a bit of a bounce back from him i don't see any reason why he should be such a bad three-point shooter and it it just hasn't happened and that's been a a big hit to the sort of shooting potency off the bench it's honestly why gary trent jr is such a breath of fresh air coming off the bench because oh this guy can shoot threes is great um 
where, where are you at with Boucher? Is there any concern there about the last little stretch here? I would imagine he's going to kind of get back to his usual form and be, you know, the fifth most important player on the team and all that. But it's been a bit of a down stretch here. The three-point shooting, I feel like maybe we just have to accept it ain't coming back and that Tampa season is long lost to history. Well, the thing last season was he was a good corner shooter. Yeah. Uh, so last season, 22% on non-corner threes. Uh, 46% on corner threes. Mm-hmm. And this season, he stayed at the same 22% on non-corner threes, but he's down to 34% on the corner right. threes. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's where the struggle is. The other thing uh, that's disappointing this season is, you know, he's generally around 65% or above uh, at the rim. He's mm-hmm. down below 60 this season. Uh, so even, you know, some of those funky finishes that he'd have last season, and, and you were like, Oh man, how did that go in? Hmm. They're not going in now. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so I think that's been a problem for him. Uh, the bad, so initially I was going to go uh, with switchability, and but we've already kind of talked about that. Sure, so sure. I am going to switch it up. Um, and Ooh. I Ooh. am going to go with uh, Pascal. Should I do a drum roll? Should I do a drum roll? <laughs> 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 uh the net rating is fake uh mm. and you know the raptors are always going to compete and make these fake comebacks uh and so they're never really going to be completely blown out of the water sure uh, and like even a game like the pelicans where uh they're down bad the game against <laughs> the nets where they're down 36 right they find a way to make it competitive in the end, mm-hmm. but then they've also had these blowout wins. Mm-hmm. And so I think the that's skewed uh, how you view the net rating and the defensive rating and the offensive rating and all of that. And so I don't think the, the, that stuff is reflective uh, of where the team has been this season. And so I don't think people should be looking at that as sort of, uh, a marker that the Raptors are better than their record or anything like that. That's fair. I mean, I, I don't think the numbers suggest that they're kind of, they're at a plus 1.3 net rating as a 500 team. So I guess they're slightly underperforming if you're going by this pure net rating. I've never really felt as though the, like there's a lot of noise in all of their numbers because of the, the guys in none of the lineup and yeah, they've had big blowouts and they've also had, you know, games they probably shouldn't have been close that they made close. But also, you know, they had a couple of games in there where they got completely waxed because they had no one available. And so I don't really know if I'm all that dubious. I mean, it's worth noting that on Clean the Glass, which isolates for garbage time, they have a negative 0.2 net rating uh, as opposed to a plus 1.3 in NBA.com. So that's probably the more indicative. But again, that's a 500 teams net rating. Um, I... I see where you're coming from for sure. I, I just feel like it's all so noisy and we've seen what 85 minutes combined as the most used lineup for the team. I don't know if any of these numbers mean anything. I don't know if any of these numbers mean anything for any of these teams. The damn Utah jazz is still fifth in net rating on cleaning the glass. Like, I don't know, man, it's been a weird season. Uh, so I note your, 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 your comment on it being bad. I, that would honestly be more, be more of a hmm to me. Like what the hell is this team actually? And I guess that leads me to my hmm is, uh, I'm having a hard time figuring out like what's like, it's just, it's more of a, huh? than a, hmm. It's like a kind of, it feels like every week the team kind of takes on a new tone and tenor and I don't really know how to reckon with it. Right. Like, you know, they could easily go and beat the Lakers and then smack the magic twice and things are all back and fine and running hunky dory. Or they could lose to the Lakers and everyone's ready to trade off Fred and everybody else. It feels like it's been a very, for a team that hasn't really had any time to sort of play together and coalesce at all, it feels as though the day-to-day sort of ups and downs of the regular season have been more drastic than, you know, you typically would see for a team that is 500. I, I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe I'm like putting too low expectation on the team or something. And maybe I'm just too much of a fear of the whole concept of expectation being a thief of joy that I'm trying to keep my expectations tempered here. Um, But like, I 
don't think I came into the season with any illusions that they were going to be the steamroller of a team with championship aspirations right away. I thought they would win a lot of games because that's what they do. And I still think they'll probably win a lot of games because that's what they do. And they were around this this mark last year and they win 48 games. Um, so I, I, I don't really know. Again, it's a huh. It's, it's a big old shoulder shrug is trying to evaluate what the hell this team is right now. I don't know if you're at the same spot. I don't know if you have a different hmm. I don't really have a specific one. I'm just kind of flabbergasted and befuddled at the day-to-day sort of oscillations in what the hell we think this team is. Yeah, I, I think maybe the, the sense of disappointment or frustration or whatever you want to call it stems from the fact that the momentum from last season hasn't necessarily carried over. And sure. what I mean by that is last season, those first 20, 25, 30 games, uh, you looked at that sample and, you know, you, you remember the way the Omicron variant raged through mm-hmm. the team. You remember that uh, you were playing a rookie in Scotty Barnes, uh, essentially a rookie in Precious Achua, and there were all these defensive mistakes and, mm-hmm. and a lot of learning going on, and you were saying, okay, let's see what it looks like once things get ironed out. And then it turned around, and you were like, okay, they figured it out. Mm-hmm. And so now this season, to again go back to that starting point of like they got to learn the defense again, mm-hmm. I think that's where my frustration comes in like that should have like those building blocks were already in place. So why has like (laughs) the, (laughs) the exact same starting line from last season? Why are we still there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So for my, Hmm, uh, post game speaking with Pascal first, Mm -hmm. he brought up focus multiple times. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I think when you look at the inconsistencies of this team this season, uh, you can see where he's coming from. He talked about attention to detail, and he said little things. But the little things can also be big things when it comes to like being, you know, what is it now, like eleven and twelve um, versus uh, twelve and twelve. Give him twelve credit. and twelve. Twelve they're, and twelve. They're a perfectly five hundred team. <laughs> Which yeah, has them 12 along and 12. With literally every other team in the NBA. It seems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and those little things can be the difference between 12 and 12 and, you know, 14 and 10 or 15 and 9. Mm. Uh, and OG, I asked him after, like, what would you attribute it to? And he was like, I don't know, but I know Pascal is right. Mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I think that is something that I'm looking for going forward mm-hmm. is that attention to detail. Yeah. And I mean, look, it's a, uh, it's a difficult team within which to like not pay attention to the details. Cause the details are frankly, what gives this team its edge, right? It's the, all right, well, we're going to milk all we can at a transition because our half court offense is meh. Uh, we're going to hit every single defensive rotation because if we do that, we're a pretty impenetrable monster. And if you start missing those key details, then the whole thing kind of comes unspooled and you have Jason Tatum going off for 17 points in the third quarter. Also, like, it's the Celtics. We should probably say this. Like, the Celtics are incredible. And a loss to the Celtics should probably not be creating all like this widespread pandemonium. Yes, they're on a second night of a back-to-back. They've also been undefeated on back-to-backs all season long. I don't think that matters. Um, Yes, they were missing a couple of starters, but they weren't missing the most important ones. And I just, the Celtics are really good. There's no shame in losing to the Celtics, especially, um, you know, when you kind of, it's not like they rolled over and died from day, from minute one. Like they had themselves a pretty inspiring first half and all of that. It sucks that they couldn't keep it going, but guess what? That's what the Celtics do. They do it to everybody. They're probably going to win the championship. And maybe, just maybe, taking a loss to the best team in the NBA is not something that should have you looking internally at, you know, the sort of the the long-term viability of anything or whatever. And I'm not saying that's what you're doing. I just feel like that's kind of the general vibe I get from the onlines. Uh, (laughs) But, yeah, it's... um, 
it's not fun. I would rather see them win a bunch of games, and thankfully they got a couple more against the Magic coming up this weekend. But we should round it there. We got World Cup to watch, baby. Spain, Morocco, it's coming up. Uh, it will already have happened probably by the time you hear this, or at least the first half is in by the time it's posted. Either way, Big V, thanks so much for hanging, man. Thanks for going longer than usual. Felt like we had to kind of get some stuff off our chest today. Anything mm-hmm. you would like to promote for the good people out there? Usual stuff, raptors.com. I will have a Scotty piece coming soon um with some thoughts from his camp included Mm -hmm. uh so you can look forward to that and besides that world cup stuff yeah footy proper it's coming down uh we'll round it there thank you so much for tuning in uh i gotcha Gotcha. Uh, <laughs> we'll be back again tomorrow. Katie Heindel will pop by. It feels like a perfect time to tap into our feelings with Katie Heindel. So you got that to look forward to tomorrow. We will recap uh, the Lakers game on Thursday, look ahead of the weekend on Friday, all that good stuff. And uh, we'll round it there. In the meantime, go listen to Locked On Sports today, our daily rip around the sports world with all the most important stuff that happened the night before. Jam packed into 22 minutes or left with our host Pete Bukowski. Joe, go check it out. Locked on Sports Today, wherever you get your podcast and on YouTube. And uh, ta ta for now. We'll see you Wednesday. Bye bye. 